America, which with North America, we're looking at the United States and Canada uh, in regard to the organization of this section. Uh, now, we're looking at the physical geography. That's your first key topic. Uh, there are going to be several that we're going to look at. And your central question, which is going to carry over into the next section as well, is what determines settlement in North America? Like, what are all the things that go along with why people live where that they live in North America? First subsection we're looking at is the landscapes and how the landscapes play into development. Uh, there's two different things we're going to look at. First is there are vast lands. These areas of North America, United States and Canada, are huge. These are two of the largest sized countries in the world. The largest country in the world is Russia. Number two is Canada. And number three is the United States. So you put Canada and the United States together and you're, you're looking at an eighth of the world's total land mass. So we're looking at huge, vast areas when we're talking about North America and their physical geography. The second is there are abundant resources uh, in dealing with the physical geography of North America. You've got fertile soils throughout most of the region. You've got ample water, which is talking about you've got enough water to sustain a lot of people. And the people have lived off of this water and settled near this water consistently for transportation purposes, uh, as well as to help the government kind of control the whole area by going up and down these waterways. You've got vast forests throughout the area, which have helped the timber industry. And you've also got a lot of resources. I put vast resources again. There's a bunch of different resources. That's fossil fuels, that's minerals, that's gems, that's those different things that make up the different types of resources that are available in this area. All right, kind of switching gears here, our next, next subject section is dealing with varied landforms. And there's a couple of different ones that we're going to be looking at. These are varied landforms of the United States and Canada. Uh, the first are the eastern lowlands. So we're looking at the eastern areas of this land mass uh, and looking at the flat coastal plains. That's what you're going to see on the eastern areas next to the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic coastal region is looking at the coastal plain from northeastern United States, like with New England, all the way down into Florida. That's the Atlantic coastal plain along the Atlantic coast. And then from Florida down into Texas, we're looking at the Gulf coastal plain. That's what we're going to be dealing with uh, with these two different areas and the Piedmont, not Piedmont, but the Piedmont as it is pronounced, uh, is looking at your area. Uh, this is the Appalachian Highland area east of the Appalachian Mountains in this flat kind of area in between the Appalachian Mountains and uh, the Atlantic coast. So that's what we're dealing with the flat coastal plains. The next are your actual Appalachian Highlands. Now these highlands are called highlands because they're tall. Uh, and this is your Appalachian Mountain Zone. Appalachian Mountains are very, very long stretch of mountain ranges. They go all the way from Canada to into the United States, down to the south, into Alabama. It stretches about 1,600 miles from Canada down into Alabama. So a very long mountain range, and it is a very old mountain range. The reason that I call it an old mountain range is you can see that by its peaks. Its peaks are very rounded because of erosion, because of wind and sediment and things blowing across uh, and even pieces breaking away because of weathering and it becomes rounded and with rounded mountains you can assume that they are older mountains and that they've been there longer because if they're newer that compression and that, that zone, convergent zone, is going to be sharp and it's going to have a point and it's not going to be rounded because of erosion yet. The next area or subregion that we're looking at of the area is the interior lowlands. These interior lowlands are in fact low elevation wise, close to sea level, but they're found within the interior. They're not along the plains, they're not along the Appalachian Mountains. These are caused by glaciers. There's three subregions of interior lowlands that's important that we get down. The first of which is the interior plains. The interior plains lowland area is the area west of the Appalachian Mountains pushing all the way to the Mississippi River. This area has been flattened by glaciers as they break away from the Appalachian Mountains and as they scrape across the landmass, they create this flat land. Your next is your Great Plains, also caused by melting and receding glaciers. This is more towards your central area, central United States, up into Canada. And then your Canadian Shield is much further north, uh, but it's also formed by, by these glaciers melting and receding. All right, moving right along with some other types of um, physical features or subregions, we're looking at the western mountains, plateaus, and basins. Now, kind of as a quick review, 
plateau is an area that is flat at the top and then has steep sides. That's what we're looking for. And basins are kind of flatter areas in between mountains. Uh, they're generally very fertile, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Your western mountain ranges, you've got the Rocky Mountains in the west. The Rocky Mountains are very rugged mountains, and they are younger mountains than the Appalachian Mountains because there's not as much erosion going on with the Rocky Mountains than there are in the Appalachian Mountains. You also have the Continental Divide, which is on the Rocky Mountains, and the Continental Divide is talking about where the rivers flow and where the rivers switch from flowing east to west. Uh, which would be on the other, on the left side of the mountains, and then from west to east as they're going towards the oceans. But that continental divide uh, is in within the Rocky Mountains themselves. You also, towards the west, have the Sierra Nevada mountain ranges and the Cascade ranges, which run parallel to the Pacific Ocean uh, along California and Canada coastline. Uh, that's those areas and those mountain ranges. You have some islands in the area. Canada has three different islands in the Arctic Circle. Not a lot of habitation inhabitants in these areas because it's so cold. Greenland, which is a massive island to the northeast of Canada, uh, which on flat projections look very distorted because on Mercator projections, the top areas are very distorted. So Greenland actually looks the size of Africa, but it's actually 16 times smaller than Africa. It's all about the proportions of that projection. You also have some volcanic islands in the United States. The islands around Hawaii and the islands around Alaska, which are referred to as the Aleutian uh, Island Ranges. Uh, next subsection, subsection that we're going to look at are the resources that have shaped the way of life. First, we want to look at oceans and waterways. This is one of the most important aspects of North America. That's what helped it develop so rapidly and become so successful. You've got the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are eight of the world's 15 largest freshwater lakes. Uh, they're located in uh, the United States. You've got the Mississippi River. I'm sorry, they're just lakes, not freshwater lakes. You've got the Mississippi River, which flows pretty much all the way from the southern portion of the United States to the northern portion of the United States. Very long, very influential river and waterway in regards to success uh, for the United States at young year and younger ages. And then you have the McKinsey River in Canada, which is Canada's longest river. Very influential. The area is full of land and full of forests. You've got fertile soils, which have made the land, which has made the area very um, successful in farming and still so today. And you've also got huge forest industries throughout the world looking at timber and lumber uh, throughout the region, which have added to the success of North America. We've also got a lot of minerals and fossil fuels. These are vats. There's a lot of these. This has led to the industrialization of the area uh, because you've got things and resources that can fuel industries and fuel these factories, and they can be found within the region themselves. Okay, you'll notice that we're actually changing kind of sections here and changing our heading to climate and vegetation. We're moving from physical geography into the climate and vegetation. First subsection that we're looking at is shared climates and shared vegetation zones. The cold climates that are shared are mainly dealing with uh, similar latitude zones, like the Alaskan coast as well as areas within Canada are very, very cold, extremely cold. A lot of times the soil is known as permafrost, which means it's permanently frozen year round, most of the time. So you're not gonna have a lot of farming and it's so harsh and cold that people move away from these zones because of that coldness. Also, elevation zones share cold areas because if you're on top of the Rocky Mountains, it's just like being on top of the Appalachian Mountains, just like being on top of the Cascade Zones, which can create cold climates that can be shared, as well as vegetation zones that can be shared amongst these different areas. Your moderate climates that are shared also kind of vary depending on latitude uh, because your latitude zones are going to determine the types of climate. So if you're on kind of the lower mid latitude zones instead of the high latitude zones along that zone, you're going to have moderate climates. Also the wind systems. Within this area there's what's known as prevailing westerlies and a lot of times you have warmer areas because these westerlies are blowing from the west to the east in Canada and the United States and generally because of location on sides of mountains you're going to have warmer temperatures. If you've got the rain shadow effect and deserts going on on the western side, that can affect warmer air that's blowing over into the east and make it a little bit warmer than it normally would be. But mainly if you're sharing a moderate climate, most of the time it's kind of revolving around your position on a continent. 
just your location within a region. So if you're a little bit north outside of the Great Plains versus the same northern area to the east of the Great Plains, you might have different climates just because your location on the continent because of these different things. What we're looking at is the differences in climate and vegetation. There's, these are kind of your differences from the shared areas. Your milder climate zones, which you've got humid subtropical here, this is going to be dealing with your southern states in the United States, kind of the south that we're looking at. It's going to be a little bit milder climates uh, and fit into that humid subtropical zone. We've also got Mediterranean climates in uh, the southern coast of California that you don't see anywhere else throughout the zone, throughout the region. Uh, the next kind of exceptions to our shared climates and vegetations is your dry climates. Your semi-arid climates you're going to see along the Great Plains area, and then you don't see it again. Your desert climates you see kind of in the southwestern zones of the United States, and then you don't see it anywhere else, like the Sonora uh, and the Mojave Desert, uh, kind of in the southwestern area of the United States. And then you don't see that exception again. Your tropical climates, we do have tropical climate zones in this area. In Hawaii, you've got tropical wet. In Florida, you've got tropical wet and tropical dry climate zones that kind of lead to the swampy areas, but you've got this tropical regions. These are kind of your exceptions to the rule. In your last slide, I'm actually introducing a new topic, human environment interaction. That's what we're looking at here. How are humans changing, modifying, adapting to the environment in this area? Uh, first section I'm looking at is the settlement patterns and agriculture and how that alters the land. Ag for agriculture. First thing I want to look at is the Berenchia land strait. This is the idea that thousands of years ago, ancient Asian nomads walked across the Berenchia land strait as the ocean levels were lower because water was trapped in glaciers and there was actually a land bridge that they walked across from Beringia into Alaska. And then from Alaska, they started settling down further into the United States, looking and settling around water areas. Um, and these are kind of your Inuit, your Eskimo peoples. These are descendants from the Asians that, know, that wandered from uh, their area. Agriculture was kind of the main thing that kept them going. And even today, agriculture is huge in this area, especially the further south you go because you've got fertile land and your climate uh, allows for it. Next uh, human environment interaction we've got is the building of cities. There's one kind of unique area in Canada of Montreal, Canada, which is extremely cold, but the city is really big. And the reason that that is, is they've actually started building parts of the city inside of the mountains to keep warm. So that's kind of cool. And then Los Angeles, I put this on here as an example because urbanization is happening rapidly in this area. Because of the industrial revolution and the industrialization of the region, cities like Los Angeles are huge uh, and they're growing. And so you're having to really focus on transportation systems and providing for all these people. Last but not least, we've got to overcome distances. At the very beginning of the unit, we talked about the actual size and the land mass of the countries. We've got to figure out, or we have, people had to figure out how to overcome those distances. One is the St. Lawrence Seaway, which is in Canada. This seaway is very similar to the Panama Canal in that it has locks. The um, sea level is a lot higher in parts of it, in, in areas than it is when you get close to the coast. So they have these locks that these boats and ships have to come into to lower it or to raise it to get it to areas. And that's how they overcome getting from the coast into Canada. Transcontinental railroads have been built uh, throughout both regions, meaning across the continent to, to improve transportation. And you're going to start seeing a lot more railroads in the world today than we already do. Right now, you have a domination of national highway systems of roads of interstates that have allowed transportation easier throughout the area.